First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the first Australian from whom, whose traditional lands we meet and whose cultures are among the oldest in human history. The Marla Lectures are a biennial activity of the Australian Mathematical Society and are funded jointly by the Society and by the Australian Mathematical Sciences Institute. They are partly funded by a request from the late Kurt Marla, one of the first mathematicians appointed at the ANU. In honour of Marla's research field, the uh, Marla lecturer is usually chosen to be a number theorist. This year we are especially pleased to have as our Marla lecture, lecturer uh, one of the world's most eminent number theorists, Professor Peter Sarnak from Princeton University and from the Institute for, for Advanced Study in Princeton. Peter Sarnak was born in South Africa and moved to the US for graduate school. After appointments at Stanford University and New York University, he moved to Princeton University, where he has been since 1991. He has had a major influence on the course of modern analytic number theory, both directly through his many research papers and through his numerous graduate students, some of whom are themselves major figures in number theory. Professor Sarnak's talk today will be on number theory and the circle patterns of Apollonius. Please join me in welcoming this is an act of A&E Academy. I won't use any <coughs> microphone. I have a loud voice. I have a New Jersey accent. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> there are many South Africans in this country, and I know you probably could recognize my accent. Just let me make sure this is on. Well, it's a great pleasure to me, for me to be here. I feel like I've been making this trip from New Jersey around Australia up to the Mecca of uh, where Marla came from. Marla was here, and I have finally arrived at his stomping ground. Uh, he was a great number theorist, contributed to many different aspects of number theory. Uh, and one of the things that I will try to describe in this lecture is how we want to get rid of some of his work. <laughs> because it applies to problems that are too, uh, um, too well known, maybe. So I'll try to explain this as we go along. OK, so my, my topic is the circle packings of Apollonius. So that's Apollonius. Uh, it was quite, I hadn't quite, until I prepared this lecture, I hadn't seen a picture of him. When I saw a picture of him, I saw that his nose is very much like mine. <laughs> So maybe this, I always told people I have a Greek nose, a Greek god's nose, but <laughs> he was a god of number theory at the time. Uh, he's very well known for studying circles, conics, he, termed the, he coined the terms parabola, ellipse, hyperbola, uh, conic sections were certainly uh, one of his favorite things, and uh, parameter spaces of circles, which is what I'm going to describe in a second. So that's as much as we'll have of his picture. These are a bit distorted there. Are they distorted there? No. Good. What you have here are three coins. This took me a long time to find. I was looking for three magical coins, and I looked in all denominations, even the Australian, mostly the South African, all over. I wanted them to be circular. Uh, and then, lo and behold, the ones that worked were the quarter, nickel, and dime. That's why those pictures are there. Now, what was I looking for? I put these three coins together. They're mutually tangent. If you think there's a size of a U.S. coin, uh, this is, I'm declaring the diameter to be 24 millimeter for the quarter. Uh, is that the quarter? I think so. Yeah. Well, anyway, these are yeah, that's the biggest one. So, uh, if you go to a website, you'll find that in some websites it's 24 millimeters point zero something, and in other ones it's uh, I wonder if the people who actually think that there's a size to the coin believe that their coins are of rational diameter. I don't know. <laughs> but this is extremely important for me that these be uh, rational numbers. That's vulgar fractions, if you want to call them that, because I'm going to be doing some number theory, which is in the title. So one thing is for sure. These are accurate to the nearest millimeter. So <laughs> I'd, and since these worked after a long search, what do I mean by work? So you take these three. I'm going to prove one theorem in this lecture. This is the first time in this entire series that I'm proving a theorem, so you'll have to watch for that. I'll prove that theorem, and that theorem will tell me there's a unique circle inside here which is tangent to all three. 
I put that circle inside there, and a miracle happens. That circle also has a rational diameter. I'm going to prove that for you. That was a miracle I was looking for, and I don't know any other coins that do that. Any three, unless you take two coins to be equal, then it's much easier. All right. Now, because we're going to do some, something to do with whole numbers, that's what number theory is, I scaled that picture up here by 252. It's convenient. And it's also much more convenient not to talk about the radii or diameters of the coins, but rather their curvatures. Because I'm going to be filling in that space with more and more coins, and the coins are going to get, well, more and more circles anyway. There are no more coins left. <laughs> I don't know any coin that fits in there. They, we'll fill them in circles, these loon regions, and they, they will be get, getting very small. So their radii will get small. I don't want to see small numbers. I'd rather see big numbers. So I'll look at their curvatures. So the curvature is just one over the radius. So what you have a picture here, which is just a restatement of the previous picture you saw, is that these three, that's what I started off with. I, uh, in that picture, we had the one in the middle. You'll see in the middle in a moment. It doesn't matter whether I go inside or outside. There's, this is the key symmetry of the whole lecture. Let me go on the outside now. There's a unique circle tangent to all three on the outside. And this circle has curvature 11. But because this is the only circle that's going to contain everybody else, there's an orientation in this problem, this guy's going to get a minus 11. Nobody else will have a negative number in front of it. So what these numbers are that you see in the circles are the curvatures of these circles. And now, and this is where Apollonius comes in. I'm going to prove this theorem of Apollonius. His theorem is that if you're given three mutually tangent circles, there are exactly two other circles which you can place which are mutually tangent to all three. Here's one of them. There's one over there. But anyway, in each of these loon regions, we're going to put a unique circle, according to Apollonius, and fill this picture in. So these four have, by the miracle was I looked very hard and found that these four had whole numbers. The miracle is this will continue forever. So that is, if you put these, this circle there, that circle there, that circle there, and that circle there, they also have whole numbers for their curvatures. This is highly unexpected. You should not have expected that. If you did, very good for you. I certainly uh, would not have expected that. And now, once we have that, we have all these new sets of holes. We can count how many holes there are, and we continue to put these things on, in, and we continue that forever, and that is called an Apollonian packing. This is an Apollonian packing, which clearly has whole numbers or diphantine aspects. Diphantine means whole numbers, especially with, when you refer to equations. It's another Greek, Diophantine, uh, that we, if you're interested in theory of numbers, you would ask, what numbers do you see here? Is there a pattern? Is there some law as to which numbers are appearing here? The first thing I want to point out here is I wasn't aware of this Apollonian packing until about six years ago. I learned it from a fellow called Jeff Legarius. Uh, he told me, have I ever looked at Apollonian, the integral structure, integral means whole number, structure of Apollonian packings, and I said, packings? There's only one Apollonian packing. What are you talking about? Because I thought that, over the, and it's true, over the real numbers, all these packings are the same. You can, in a kind of transformation that I'll show you in a minute, certain inversions show that all, there's only one Apollonian packing. However, if you're interested in these whole numbers, it turns out, as he said, there were infinitely many, and in fact, he'd written many papers, and it was a very famous <laughs> set of ideas, and I learned that from him by telling him that he doesn't know what he's talking about, running home and seeing that he knows exactly what he's talking about, and then spending the next six years thinking about what he said. So let me tell you uh, about these integral Apollonian packings. Firstly, they are infinitely many. We'll see that, and the number theory of this is very challenging, and I'm going to try to explain that, and it takes us beyond Mahler and many other people. The kind of question that you ask here is which integers appear here? It is very typical in the theory of numbers that it's very easy to ask questions, very hard to answer them. That's the beauty. Everybody can understand the question. If you ask for Mahler's last theorem, it's a very simple question. Its solution is understood by a handful of people in the world. So the techniques to solve these kind of problems are often extremely sophisticated using all branches of mathematics. But the beauty is the questions are always uh, supposed to be explainable in a public lecture. <laughs> so the question that 
Okay, I, if, if uh, we had a second screen here, or we had used the second screen, we might have put this up there, and I would leave it up there for you to look for patterns that we're going to be s studying along the way. Of course, the numbers are so small here, you can't see them, but if you had a computer, I guess you could make it bigger. Anyway, are there infinitely many primes? Are there any, infinitely many circles whose curvatures are prime numbers? We love prime numbers. Are there any, infinitely many pairs of circles whose curvatures are prime numbers? I will call those twin primes. Are there, is there actually a rule? Can you tell me which numbers are appearing in this packing? So it's a random question, maybe, but the techniques are, the one, are really interesting, as I hope to at least convince you of some, one or two things. The first person to discover this integral structure is actually a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry by the name of F. Soddy. I don't know why he was looking at it. He found this. He was so excited by it, he even wrote a poem, a well-known poem about it, but I won't repeat that. I don't think the poem is so great, but it does rhyme. <laughs> um, you can find that, I'm sure, easily by going on the web. Anyway, he's the first, amazingly, to discover this integral property, and I'm going to, that's the one theorem I'll prove to you is that those things are whole numbers. There's a very beautiful paper, of, I mentioned Ligarius already, of five authors, Graham, Ligarius, Mellows, Wilkes, Yan. This is a um, Bell Labs paper. This was done in Bell Labs. They were all there working in teams as they do over there. And they asked all, uh, many of the interesting, they set this up as a Diophantine problem and asked many of the interesting questions. And what's happened in the last four or five years is we now have tools to answer pretty much all the questions, and the tools come from all sorts of fields in mathematics. Modular forms, sh you should have expected. That's the sort of the main uh, bulldozer in modern number theory. Ergodic theory, that seems to be something in probability theory. It plays a role. Hyperbolic geometry, spectral theory, additive combinatorics, all these are entering in understanding this problem. So, of course, I'm not going to go into proofs of what I'll say, but I will give you some demonstrations of some truths, except for this theorem of Apollonius. Since he's in the title, I want to give you the proof and the proof from the book. I'll explain to you what that means in a second. So his theorem says, given three circles mutually tangent, there are exactly two circles, C and C primed, which are tangent to all three. To do that, I'm going to use some geometry, which I hope is taught in in Australia in schools, but it wasn't in South Africa, I can tell you that, when I was there anyway, and hopefully it's a bit better than now. Anyway, this is uh, a kind of transformation which preserves circles and preserves angles. So I'm going to use group theory, well, really, I'm not going to actually use it yet, but I want you to focus on the following. If I have a circle, he has one circle of radius r, and if I invert every point, by which I mean I'll take P to Q, where the distance from P, the distance from P to the center of the circle, and distance from Q to the circle, the product of those two is the square of the radius. So this P will go to that Q. The origin will go to infinity, the fine point. And you can write down a formula for that transformation. It's very easy. And if you use that formula, you will see that circles go to circles. And if two curves cross at a certain angle, the image will also have that same angle. So tangencies are preserved, angles are preserved, and circles are preserved. There's only one lie there. A circle can be a straight line. A straight line through infinity is a degenerate circle. So some circles will go to straight lines. This is a Mobius transformation in modern mathematics. Okay, so you use this transformation. That's all I will use. I'm now going to prove for you Apollonius' theorem without any calculations, just this thing. But I didn't show you that the, those were preserved, that you have to make a calculation. <laughs> so here are my three circles, C1, C2, and C3, the, the, the dark circles. And I want to find the unique circle there, that one, and C primed, C primed and C double primed, which are tangent to all three. Okay, let me take this point C, which is mutually tangent to C1 and C2, and let me invert so I'm going to take C to infinity, so I'm going to invert in C. Remember, I'm just going to take any circle whose center is C, any circle in the world, and invert in that circle. Then C will go to infinity, circles will go to circles, tangencies will be preserved. All right, so C2 is now going to be going a circle through infinity. I'll call it C2 prime. It may not be parallel this way, it might be parallel that way. That's a minor point, so that's my one image. 
C1 primed also goes through infinity and it touches at C at infinity. That's the tangency point. So the, that's where these two circles go. The third circle, C3 goes to C3 primed. It's got to be tangent to both of these. And the only circles tangent to both of these, just by looking at it with your eyes, is a circle like this. So those are my three circles. And now it's plain and obvious what the two circles we're looking for are. There's one on the right and there's one on the left. This guy and that guy. And you can just stare at it and see there aren't any other circles around that can be tangent to these given three circles. So in this configuration, we found the answer. And now because that operation was invertible, I just invert back and I find the, three, the two circles that we were talking about. So this is Apollonius' theorem, and that uh, was the heart of the construction of the Apollonian packing, was to put circles which were mutually tangent to and as you can see, there's a symmetry. The, would you choose this one or that one? The minute you don't know which one to choose, you know that there's something important about it. A group symmetry, a Galois symmetry, they're all the same thing here, and that's going to be the group that dictates the answers to everything. Okay, Apollonius is not enough for us. We also need Descartes. Descartes, the guy who loved the coordinates, <laughs> and he wrote everything down in, in terms of Cartesian coordinates and equations. And this is a famous theorem of his, which he wrote the, uh, I don't have a proof from the book. Nobody has a proof from the book. The, I, the, the proof, the previous proof I will declare from the book, meaning I don't want to see any other proof. This is the best proof. You didn't have to calculate. All proofs of this theorem that I know uh, do require some unpleasant calculation. I have it at the end of the lecture, but I'll purposefully run out of time so that I won't show it to you. Uh, so, this is the remarkable statement of Descartes. He wrote it, he himself, according to Coxeter, didn't have a proof. Coxeter pointed out a slight flaw in the argument. It's actually in a letter of his to some princess. I guess he thought this theorem would be by something. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyway, it's a beautiful theorem. It's like Pythagoras' theorem. It's a little more sophisticated. So the theorem is the following. Suppose I have four mutually, four now, not three, four mutually tangent circles, like the starting four that I had there with my coins and the one on the outside, and with that sign convention. Then those four curvatures, the A's are always the curvatures, A1, A2, A3, A4, satisfy a quadratic equation. And the quadratic equation is that F of A, F is this quadratic form, twice the sum of the squares minus the sum of all the numbers squared, the quadratic expression in the A1, A2, A3, A4, that f of A is always zero. And if and only if, if you have four numbers which satisfy this equation, you can find four circles with that property. So that's Descartes' theorem, and I don't have a really uh, book pr proof from the book, so I skip that. All right, now I want to prove to you Soddy's observation and explain to you that uh, what Soddy had realized, or what he's doing, has really to do with that uh, lack of choice of th which circle you want to do, that's the heart of the whole problem, and that's where all the Diophantine properties also come. From there is where all the, that's where they come from. Okay, so suppose I have four mutually tangent circles with curvatures A1, A2, A3, A4. They must satisfy this equation. I'll, re re I'll come back to this uh, quadratic equation later, but for now, uh, suppose I have such a, a story, and now I use Apollonius' theorem one of these, so I fix the A1, A2, A3, or C1, C2, C3. The fourth circle has curvature A4. And there's another fourth circle, which is also tangent to the first three, and it's got curvature A4 prime. Well, according to this theorem, both A4 and A4 prime, these are fixed, satisfy this quadratic equation. That is to say that A4 and A4 prime, A4 prime are solutions to the same fixed quadratic equation in one variable because now the A1, A2, A3 are fixed. So now you go back to high school for the formula for the solution to a quadratic equation. It's minus B plus minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC over 2A. I'm not that jet lag. And you get a relation. That the sum of the roots is this expression. You just calculate it. And in fact, the two roots are, and you compute the minus b, and you get a1, a2, a1 plus a2 plus a3, plus minus twice the square root of this quantity. So this quantity is really the most important in terms of the questions of rationality 
of the circles. Because, remember I start with three circles as I did with my three coins, which I declared to be 21, 24, and whatever it was. Uh, if this number delta, so if I have now the fourth guy, I'm looking at A4 and A4 primed. I want to see if the new guy, the fourth circles, the two of them, they, I can't distinguish them. If, they ha if the first three have whole, are whole numbers, it would be nice for the fourth one to be whole numbers, and that would depend on whether this number has a, whether that square root is perfect, whether that's a perfect square delta. And that's the miracle of... Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Not sure who made them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so thank you. Anyway, in my example, which was 21, 24, and 28, you compute what delta is. It's 42 squared, and that was the miracle. And that's why the circle in the middle was a rational number. So that's what I went through these coins, looking for three coins such that this delta, that expression, corrected, is a perfect square. And that's very unlikely, but if you look long enough, hopefully you could find it. And of course, if you can cook up the numbers yourself, you'll find it. <laughs> All right, so that's the miracle. And once that happens, then notice the following. That once I have that four of them, which are whole numbers, then if these, the four starting ones have whole numbers, and I make one step in this Apollonian move, which is to put one new circle in, the new guy, A4 primed, from this expression here is minus a4 plus 2a1 plus 2a2 plus 2a3. It's a great property of the integers that if you add integers, you get an integer, and if you multiply integers, you get an integer, and that's <laughs> really the only property they really have at ease. So this is very convenient, and that's so the proof of Sadi's theorem. From now on, each time you put in a new circle, the expression in terms of the four circles, the three circles and the two ones you're playing off against each other, uh, the new guy, if the first four are whole numbers, then each time you put a new guy, it's a whole number, and each newborn guy is a whole number. So the curvatures from now on are going to be whole numbers, and that's his observation, and he was very happy with it. And it is rather remarkable. Okay. Um, what else? Wrong, wrong computer. <laughs> now, the minute... Thank you. <laughs> this young man typed this for me. You know, I said if I run into trouble, he's just going to take over. <laughs> okay, I'm now going to describe these uh, moves in terms of matrices. So I hope you all at least have some vague idea what a matrix is. This is an array of numbers like this that you can multiply. Matrices, you can add them. In this case, we're going to multiply them. So the Statement that A4 primed was minus A4 plus 2A3 plus 2A2 plus 2A1 was a statement that can be written in one line with a matrix notation as follows. That A4 primed, this should, uh, that the, this should be A prime, not A4 prime. The new vector A prime, the new vector of uh, curvatures, so the first three are unchanged, but the fourth guy changed by this combination. Now notice I'm multiplying on the right because it's much nicer to multiply rows some matrices to get back a row. A vector should be a row, not a column. Okay, that's the only reason I'm multiplying on the right, which is rather unusual, I guess. Anyway, so a, this is A primed, and that's A4 primed. So this is a little misprint there. It's not serious. So you get the new guy from the old guy by multiplying by S4. And that's if you take the first three circles to produce a fourth one. Now there are four ways of choosing three circles out of four circles, and you can take any three to produce the new element, and so they are generated by these four matrices. So I'm now going to define simply these matrices. They are the matrices which the Apollonian packing follows, and in a way that I'll describe here, and there'll be a little more notation here, is I take S4, it's this four by four matrix with whole number entries, and similarly with those, you can easily check that if I square any of these matrices, you'll get the identity. The determinant, if for those of you know what that is, of any of these is minus one. The inverse, well, from this, of this matrix is also a whole number, a, whole, um, a matrix with whole numbers. So I'm going to take these matrices and I'm going to look at all expressions in them, or what is called the group generated by these four by four matrices. 
This group, we call the Apollonian group, it's the symmetry group of this problem. It's the group which captures that feature that any time, I don't know whether to choose in Apollonius's theorem, which of those two circles, I don't know which to choose, that's the sign of a group. That's what the Goa theory is about, and this is the Goa group of this problem. So, concretely, we're just going to look at all matrices that you get. You will never leave the 4 by 4 matrices of determinant 1, that's all, or minus 1, that's all this big notation is over there. And I get a, a matrix group, a subgroup, of the 4 by 4 integer matrices. That means any element here can be multiplied with any other element and get, to, to get a new element in that, and the inverse is also in there. This group is the key thing in the whole problem, and I'm going to explain to you why understanding the Diophantine properties of Apollonian packing is difficult, precisely because this group is a new kind of beast. So it is a symmetry group of the packing. All right, now I'm going to uh, just reformulate what I've been saying in words. If you take your four vector, so this is a point whose coordinates are all integers in four dimensions, so it's in Z4, a four tuple of curvatures, that's our, remember, you think of our starting guy, which was minus 11 and those other three numbers. And you take this Apollonian group and you multiply, you fix A, and you take all elements in the group and you multiply each element in the group times A, you'll get a new four vector. And if you follow roughly what I was saying, you will find that these four tuples that you get of whole numbers consist precisely of all four tuples of circles in that packing which are mutually tangent. But of course, I don't know which elements I get here in Z4. This is called an orbit of a group. And that's a very subtle question. Maybe it's even undecidable, you might guess. And if you generalize the problem a little bit, that is the case as to who's in the orbit or even who's in the group. We only have generators for the group. The generators are S1, S2, S3, S4. Well, it would be nice if the group had another description, but that's what I'm going to show you is not the case. Number one. Since all these vectors we're producing here are four tuples of mutually tangent circles, they must obey Descartes' theorem. So they must, all these integers we'll ever get will all lie on f of a equals zero. That was Descartes' theorem. Now, f is a quadratic form, and the zero set of a quadratic form, the, by the law of inertia, this has signature 3, 1, for those who know what I'm talking about. The, this is a quadratic form. The zero set is a cone. So these points all line a cone in four-dimensional space, and they all whole number points. You might ask if you're getting all points this way. Well, let's look a little further. Let me take those S1, S2, S3, S4, those transformations. F of Sj times x is F of x. That's not too surprising because we, these S's took me from this cone back into itself. It's probably the case that they take me, they don't change the value of F. Now, I hope most people know what the rotations in three dimensions are, motions which keep you at a fixed distance from the origin, so you rotate about an axis. That would be the rotation group of x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared. Here we have a more complicated quadratic form. It's the Descartes form. Its signature is 3, 1. The rotations, the transformations, 4 by 4 transformations which preserve f, meaning f of x, s, s, x is f of x for any point x, are called orthogonal transformations for this form. And the group is called the orthogonal group. And clearly, whatever our Apollonian group is, it's a subgroup of the orthogonal group. That's all I'm saying here. So I will denote all 4 by 4 matrices which preserve this quadratic form by O of f. All 4 by 4 matrices whose entries are whole numbers, that's a much more frightening thing, but they, or many of them, I'll call O, F of Z. These are the 4 by 4 matrices which preserve the form and are integral. And our group, I've just told you, is a subgroup of that. If it were all of that, we would be in the realms of ordinary number theory, as I want to, so I'm going to spend a few minutes reminding you what standard questions are. But that's not the case. This group happens to be very small in there. It's infinite index. So it's small in a very explicit way. Uh, let me not define the index. It's, I'll just say it's thin. I just want to give you a feel. The mathematicians know certainly what, know what I'm talking about. But on the other hand, it's not too small. This is why we'll be able to say anything. 
It's a risky dance. And algebraists could not tell this group from that group by polynomial equations. So the risky topology is, is a way of telling, is a, is, a, is a set of equations, is a space defined by a set of equations. And if you look at the smallest uh, set of equations which contain all these points, it will be the same as the smallest set of equations which contain all those points, which is just the orthogonal group itself. So don't worry too much about this, but you've got to take two things away from this. That one, that this group has got something good about it in terms of geometry, algebraic geometry, and it's got something terrible about it that it's not something that we ever study in number theory because it's infinite index. The theory of quadratic forms, when this, for this whole group, the, this group is a well-studied group, goes back to Hilbert. I'm going to tell you what Hilbert's uh, 11th problem is in a second right now. Uh, is well understood thanks to many, many people, including Mahler, who studied these kind of groups. The famous Mahler compactness theorem is all about these kind of groups. He has a very beautiful compa compactness principle. So this is the theory that I don't want to talk about because it doesn't address our question here. But just to show you how hard our question is, let's just remind ourselves a typical problem of this nature. So Hilbert's 11th problem concerns solvability of e quadratic equations in whole numbers. That's it. It's called Hilbert's 11th problem. It was only solved recently, the final straw being put by Piotrowski, Shapiro, Cogdell, and myself. I want to give, remind you of a very simple equation so that you at least see the relation what Hilbert was asking compared to the problem we'll be asking here. So Hilbert's 11th problem is the following, is a generalization of the following problem that goes back to Gauss and Legendre. And I like this because it's very, very involved. This looks simple, but it's quite deep. Which numbers are sum of three squares? Now that has got no deficiencies or packings. That's just equation in whole numbers. That's what most of number theory, much of number theory is about, is a theory of Diophantine equations. Can we solve this equation? So this mankind pondered very early on, which numbers are sum of three squares? These are, everything's to be whole numbers. The one condition that you quickly see is n better be not negative because squares are not negative. Okay, so there's an obstruction there, but that's, if you think a little more, you'll see another obstruction. No number which gives remainder 7 when divided by 8 is a sum of 3 squares. Why? Because if I look at division by 8, I look at only, I do all my operations in the whole numbers, but I only look at the remainder when divided by 8. Then I, my remainders are 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 7. They only finitely many, 8 possibilities. And if I square any of those numbers, I'll get 0, 4, 1. Those are the only possibilities for the squares. And if I add any three of those, you just think, look at the possibilities, you'll never get 7. So any number which gives remainder 7 when divided by 8 is not a sum of three squares. There is an obstruction. And similarly, any number which is 4 to the a times 8b plus 7 is also not a sum of 3 squares. So there are these obvious reasons that a number is not a sum of 3 squares that anybody who thinks about it quickly comes up with. The hard and the deep theorem is once you can't find any more reasons that it's not a sum of 3 squares, maybe it is a sum of 3 squares, and that's one of the great theorems. It's the theorem of Gauss. There's a big debate who first proved this. They, uh, Legendre, more or less, well, he knew the theorem, but he didn't quite have a complete proof. Gauss has a proof. It's an entry in his diary around 1800. He starts out, Eureka, I've proved this. He was trying to prove this for a long time. Uh, he carries on in this thing. At the end of the entry, he says, and this is fantastic, I've proved this. And at the end, he says, by the way, my fourth, fifth daughter was born today. <laughs> <laughs> a minor event in this context of this theorem. So he liked this theorem. And it's a good example of a local to global principle, meaning that this is the best of all possible worlds. We have reasons that a numbers, the equation can't be solved, and the minute we overcome, and the minute we pass this condition, we are solvable. There are very few equations which obey this local to global principle. The quadratic is one. The question we're asking about the Apollonian packing is the same kind of question, but for a group which is deficient because it was born by making this packing, and it's not an arithmetic group. That's it's not the full orthogonal group OFZ, it's infinite index. Let me just amplify this point a little bit. 
So again, I go back to that cone. The set of all x such that f of x is 0. This is a cone in four dimensions. The Apollonian group, or this group OFZ, which are the four by four matrices which preserve the, the uh, quadratic form, of which all A, A's, all elements of A are in there, preserves a little more. So I define V prime, primit primitive, sorry, V prim of Z to be the points whose coordinates have no common factor. The greatest common divisor of A1, A2, A3, A4 is 1. If we start with such a point and we apply any of those Apollonian moves, you will not destroy the fact that the greatest common factor is 1. That's preserved. And what's interesting is if you take this big group, OFZ, the one that's friendly in the sense that mankind knows about it, not that it's easy. This is a great achievement of many people to understand uh, Hilbert's 11th problem. But if you take the orbit of any point A, which is primitive under this, you will get all the points. So that's why that problem has another description. The orbit there is exactly all points which satisfy an equation. While the set of circles in an Apollonian packing are the set of points which you get by keep on making these moves. I don't have a, another description of those points. So if you want to work out what's there, you have to develop a new theory. And that's why the theory, the modern theory, the theory that developed after Hilbert, is not good enough for the simple question that Sadi asked. I won't go into it, but I, we have, I've coined these thin groups because they were infinite index, whatever they was. They were deficient. They were born this way. And they come up everywhere now. Now that we start looking, they come up in monodromy, in Kalabi Yao's. I hear that Yao was here recently selling his book. Maybe you look there, <laughs> you'll see Kalabi Yao's. They're Kalabi Yao's and they're thin groups there, amazingly. There are some of these groups you can't even tell who's in the group. There's certain undecidability properties. In any event, what's happened in the last six years is a great development of theory with many contributors, making that theory not as uh, un uh, well understood as the theory of uh, following Hilbert, but enough to answer some questions. And now I'm going to tell you what are the questions we can answer for the Apollonian group. So far, I haven't told you anything about the Apollonian group, except what Sadi found, that the, they're whole numbers. All right, so now let me go through, and that's the rest of the lecture. I'm going to explain to you what we can show for the Apollonian group, but let me amplify that point that this is just an example and a very beautiful example with beautiful pictures of what is a very general theory that has come out which, which allows you to deal with these kind of situations. So the first question, if you're going to try to look for numbers with some properties, if you want to count prime numbers and you Eratosthenes or somebody like that, if you want to produce prime numbers there, first thing is you need to know how many numbers there are. So if I give you a big number x and I ask you how many numbers are less than x, well, more or less x. x could be any real number. If x is a whole number, it's, it's the floor function of x or something. I don't know if the floor includes x or not. It's always, you always miss by one. <laughs> okay, so they're roughly x integers less than x. And if you were to do a sieve, which is the kind of thing we may want to do here, we want to find all prime numbers up to x, then you would remove all the numbers which are divisible by 2, and that's roughly half of x. Remove all the numbers divisible by 3, it's roughly one-third of x. Add all the numbers divisible by 6, and then you keep this going, and then when you left, you're just left with primes. That's fine if you're running it on a computer, but if you actually want to count the number of primes this way, it's extremely difficult. That's called the sieve, and it's very difficult from that procedure to actually do the counting. You have to be, do something much more difficult. So can we count here? So this is the following. Let's look at all the circles in the packing for which their curvatures are less than a big number x. You should think here of x as a very big number, and x is going to infinity. How many <coughs> circles are there in the very first picture you saw there whose curvature is less than x? This doesn't, this is nothing to do with diophantine. This could be any packing. David Boyd, many years ago, was able to answer the first step in this. He showed that this number grows like x to a power, which is some weird fractal dimension. In other words, he showed log of this number divided by log x, when x goes to infinity, tends to a number that exists there, and it, that's the number to a few decimal places. We don't know this number exactly, but it is important for the rest of this lecture that this number is bigger than 1. It's actually the Hausdorff dimension of something called the Apollonian gasket. He showed that too, and, he gave, and his arguments were all elementary in Euclidean geometry. 
estimating inductively the new circles from the old circles using formulae. One of the things that one wanted to understand here is that maybe there's a refinement of this, an asymptotic law, and there is, and this is one of the first theorems that has emerged from this new theory, and it's a theorem of Alex Kontorovich and he O from two years ago. It's just appeared in JAMS probably, uh, one of the better journals, but not the Princeton Journal. <laughs> I have to sell the journal I'm an editor of. It's going down the hills, down the tube. Uh, I'll tell you outside later some stories. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, this is a beautiful theorem, and it gives you the refinement. That the number is, in fact, there's another constant, such that the, the number of circles whose curvature is less than x is about b times x to the delta. To show you that probably you'll never get this elementarily, is, uh, it, you might, I can't prove that, but you would have to rediscover something rather striking. This B is, c is basically determined by a base vibrating mode on a hyperbolic three-dimensional infinite volume manifold. Scattering theory is needed here. So it is quite remarkable that you can use these beautiful theories from spectral theory and geometry to do this, and if you gave an elementary proof of this, you would have to rediscover this base eigenfunction in other, another language. So it's not impossible, but it would be very interesting. So we do know the number, and this is very important if we, as we advance to try and understand the arithmetic. So let's turn to the arithmetic now. This will be used freely. The question you should be asking, and we have, I've alluded to all the time, which numbers appear there? Are there some congruence, are there some arithmetic obstruction? Just like I said that if you take a number and you want to write it as sum of three squares, you can't if it gives remainder seven when divided by eight. Now, those numbers were too small, but I expect you all noticed that the numbers in the, <laughs> the curvatures there satisfy some congruences. I'll now tell you what they are. And the interesting theorem here is we know exactly what these congruences are. So let me remind you what a congruence is. I've already been talking about it, but just to re review. We do, a, when I say mod Q, I will always look at all integers or any expression that you see there in arithmetic when you divide by Q. Q is any number greater than or equal to 1. So then there are only finitely many possibilities. And being finite, we can manipulate much more easily and understand that problem. And so that's the local theory, and we want to first understand what's happening locally and then hopefully globally when we look for the integers themselves. That's a the motto of modern number theory. So for P naught, I can't expect you to have noticed, but those are exactly the congruences. Every curvature you saw, you could certainly see it from the first four that I had there, but you generate all those numbers, and they always satisfy, they're always one of these numbers. They give the, one of, their remainder mod 24 is one of these numbers. And this is the only arithmetic such obstruction. That's not obvious, and that was proved by Elena Fuchs in her thesis last year. Could I just ask, yeah? P0 is the... Th that's the initial one. That, that's, I'm lecturing around those three coins, but in fact there are only two possibilities universally. There's only one other possibility. So she answers it for any Apollonian, integral Apollonian packing. So P could be replaced. Uh, this is for P0, yes. The, the, that this is true for all of those is more or less obvious. What do, you, you start off with your four matrices, and then you've got S1, S2, S3, S4. And if S1, S2, S3, S4, you look at what they do, mod 24. This is now a finite little diagram, and you can see what you trace out. And you see you only get these numbers. The more difficult thing is to see there's no obstruction, there's no congruent, subtle thing going on, modulo some other big prime. And I should say that that's where there's a risky density comes in. And a very beautiful theorem of a man called Weisfeiler, who tragically disappeared in South America many years ago, unexplained. All right. Now, why are we so interested in uh, counting? Suppose I want to know, I'm going to tell you a conjectured answer and something we know towards it. Which numbers are curvatures there? Well, the first thing is, remember, there are about the number of whole number, the number of curvatures up to x is about x to the 1.3. That was the theorem of Kontorovich and O. But the number of integers up to x is only x. 
So roughly, if, if God is making them at random, each integer is going to be hit roughly x to the point three times. But not every integer is there because we know that you have to satisfy these arithmetic obstructions. So you build in the arithmetic, and then you expect that you hit everything you're supposed to hit. And it's bad news. You don't. But the best, that's because very small numbers which satisfy the congruence are not hit. So then you hope maybe some, something becomes true when, you, when x gets large. And that's where I'm aiming. But before you do that, you try on a much simpler question, which is how many different numbers, not telling me which ones, how many different numbers up to x without multiplicity, so how many distinct integers up to x are the curvatures of circles in the Apollonian packing? This was a basic conjecture in the paper, not of Saudi, he didn't ask this, but of Ligarius, in fact. And this too was solved recently by Bergain and Fuchs, showing that a their conjecture was a positive proportion of all numbers are hit. And that's proved, and that uses uh, all sorts of uh, more standard tools from number theory, not this really modern theory. Uh, I, and you can find the basic idea outlined in a letter of mine. So if you go to my name on, on at Princeton, they uh, made a very important improvement on what I was doing, getting where I had some slightly weaker result. The basic idea is an ad hoc idea, I would say, coupled with standard number theory. See, my philosophy in this lecture is anything that's standard, I won't talk about much. <laughs> but the real question here that I don't know the answer to is, is there a local to global principle like in Hilbert's 11th problem? And I'm sure there is. It's just we don't have the tools to prove it. That is. Is the set of integers, which you see in this Apollonian packing, exactly all integers which give one of those remainders when divided by 24, except, so that's not true. Is it true, is that true, except for finitely many exceptions? Is it true that if, we know the exceptions, we just find them galore. I'm going to show you a picture now. But if you go far enough, because you, you have many opportunities to hit each number, about x to the 0.3, according to that, count, maybe you do eventually hit every number, and that would be a local to global principle. That would be a beautiful answer to this. You would actually have a description of exactly who are curvatures. So that we don't know, but we have some nice experiments here by Fuchs and Sandon, two Princeton students. Um, I think I'm running a bit slow, so I won't go into it, but let me t co tell you that the conjecture, so look here. Whatever this says here, it says there are 536 exceptions between 10 to the 8, 4 times 10 to the 8, and 5 times 10 to the 8. So you might say, how could I say with, any, with a straight face that this conjecture is true when there are 538 exceptions out when we've gone up to 10 to the 8? Okay, we have some theoretical ways of understanding why this is catching up slowly. Like, yeah, there are no exceptions. So I am quite confident that this local to global principle is true. And... Uh, it's much more difficult than Hilbert's 11th problem because the group A is deficient in the way I described. All right. One can prove other things. This is what I had set out initially. Are there infinitely many circles whose curvatures are prime? For example, if you went, if, if the original picture were up here, I'm asking now for some memory, you find in the middle uh, that they're actually even twin primes. They're two circles next to each other, both of which curvatures are prime? The answer is yes. There are infinitely many circles who are prime, and there are better still, there are infinitely many circles, pairs of circles who are prime, and that proof is an ad hoc proof. It does use m all the modern tools of half-dimensional sieves after a reduction, but it's true, and it's something that is uh, true for any integral Apollonian packing. Um, one of the reasons I like to put this down. I make this joke always. It's a bad joke, but I've got to make it. I've always wanted to pr prove the twin prime conjecture, so I proved the twin prime. <laughs> there are infinitely many twin primes in this picture, where I define what I mean by twin prime. The, the twin prime conjecture is a much simpler problem. That it's natural is debatable, but any, I think anybody here who's a young person, I don't see too many, but who's supposed to come to these lectures, and saw so a list of primes would can't help but asking, are there infinitely many primes whose distance from each other is two? It's not a natural question. There's a very famous story about Vinogradov, the guy who invented many of the tools to do, to do things with primes. 
he was the head of the Stakeloff Institute, a nasty man. And uh, one of the young men, it goes, the, the young guy is different in each story, but the, the story seems accurate enough. He says, uh, why does, he was a boss, why, why is our boss so famous? And he says, you don't know, he proved every large odd number is a sum of three primes. What does that mean? He thinks about it. What does that mean exactly? He says, well, I haven't thought about primes since high school, but I thought you're supposed to multiply primes, not add them. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a natural thing to ask if there are infinitely many primes in this picture, but I can't resist it. <laughs> so that's the nature of the beast. We like these kind of questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Twins, right. All right, um, I'm near the end here. Uh, you might ask, is there a prime number theorem? So we are a little short of proving that, and I'll just end with that. But the prime number theorem is a theorem about the ordinary prime numbers. The number of integers less than x is x. The number of primes less than x. How many prime numbers are there less than x? There's no formula that's useful for giving primes. But we can try to count them by all sorts of ingenious ideas. And one of the great achievements at the turn of the century, 1900, just before, 1896, due to Adama and de la Vallée-Poussin, was to prove that the number of primes less than x is roughly x divided by log x. It's called the prime number theorem. And it was one of the high points of mathematics at the time. And the, two, the techniques were quite stunning in using things from analysis and uh, zeta functions. So you could ask here, how many primes are there? Let's look here. How many, how many circles are there in P or P naught, any one of those? whose curvatures are less than x, and such that AC is prime. At this point, thanks to my other, the theorem I mentioned there that I was able to show, this does go to infinity. There are infinitely many circles which are prime, but I didn't produce this, the right number of them to make this true. So you could ask, is there a prime number theorem? Is it true that pi P of x is asymptotic, just like in the ordinary prime number theorem, to the total number, N P of x, the number of as integers you're seeing, divided by log x. Roughly, the density of primes is 1 over log, which is why that should be right, and you might even predict the constant. And we understand enough heuristics to actually predict this whole story and even check it numerically. That's what that picture is. You don't need to look at it. There's no question it's true with an exact constant. The constant is a special value of an L function, as it's called. So we know everything about what's supposed to be true, but we can't prove this prime number theorem because we really haven't understood, and it's very difficult to understand accurately enough how many, uh, to do this counting accurately enough. Nevertheless, you can give an upper bound. So some sub argument coupled with something, that's what I want to end with, is giving us an upper bound, which is at least saying that this upper bound is correct with the wrong constant. In other words, this is supposed to be roughly, roughly asymptotic, meaning constant times this over that with a God-given constant there. W this theorem says that the number is at most another constant, four times that, with that when x is large. So that's already quite remarkable information. And I want to mention that particular theorem because it uses the modern machinery that I've been alluding to. And that's the theory of thin groups. There's something called the affine sieve and spectral gaps and even... Uh, and Alex Gumbard happens to be here by coincidence. I guess he came because of it. He's uh, one of the founders of this, together with Bogan and myself. It's become a big industry. Terry Tao, who gave his lectures two, four years ago, also contributed to this. It's a theory which allows you to do this kind of mathematics with a thin group, and this is a good example of the use of that theory. Uh, I think I'm coming to the end. I said... Now, I don't want to give the proof of Descartes' theorem. It's really not from the book. It's not pleasant. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. Well, I think we have time for a few questions. We won't spend too long because there is a, uh, there will be refreshments outside. Uh, but let's have a question or two. So, are there, um are there high-dimensional analogs of this kind of line yes. set up? Yes. Like the spheres and so forth? Yes, yes, there's a whole, right, uh, the five authors 
looks at three dimensions and there are even ones in n dimensions, uh, there are slews of generalizations. And uh, I should give a reference. Uh, what I promised Andrew is when I finish all these lectures and he posts them on the web, there will be after each lecture a complete set of references so that you can follow any of these things to, to see where they are. And that's one of the, uh, the references I would get. In fact, if you start with any coxeter, uh, you know what I mean by that? Okay, the answer is they are <laughs> higher dimensional generalizations. They are a little harder to draw. The tools that apply here apply there very much the same way. Not every aspect, but most. So the, I, I hope I was making clear that this is just uh, the, the juiciest example of this phenomenon. And in some sense, not the most indicative. If you take uh, a sort of uh, monogramming, a more complicated situation, there are situations where we have no idea how to decide who's in the orbit. We can't decide, because here you can see we're getting smaller and smaller. So if we miss somebody, we know we'll never find them later. But imagine I don't know that I'm getting smaller and smaller. Then you can be in a position where you actually can ask this question and not even be able to determine whether there's specific numbers there or not, never mind a universal state. Anyway, there are higher dimensional generalizations, and they certainly already are in the works of the Gares. They wrote five or six papers. Yeah. At, at the beginning, you mentioned Marla, and you said this was related to his work, but he wanted to remove it. So what did you mean? Uh, what I meant was Marla was one of the key players in the geometry of numbers. He developed the foundations of the geometry of numbers. The study of integral quadratic forms, which is uh, all emerged after Hilbert's problem. Hilbert just asked a simple question. Solve a quadratic equation in several variables with the whole number, the answers have to be whole numbers. Everybody's whole numbers. That's a very basic question. He asked two questions, one about whole numbers and one about fractions, rations. The fraction part is much easier. This was the work of Hesse. It's a very famous theorem uh, called Hesse. And uh, Hesse principle, and he's completely understood how to solve the quadratic equation where the unknowns are fractions. But the whole number part is much, much harder. And that took much longer to solve. <coughs> and the tools that are used, I haven't said they are automorphic forms, discrete groups, moduli spaces, all these rely at the very beginning on something called the geometry of numbers, a theory which was started by Kotz to answer questions about quadratic forms like this F. And Mahler was a key player. So what I meant was he was a player in this standard and a very important theory, mainstream theory, which doesn't apply to this problem, which is why I got very interested in it. Because the group, the Apollonian symmetry A, is not that group OFZ. If it were AFZ, this would be translatable to a standard problem, not necessarily solvable, but at least a standard question in the theory in the diagram the theory of quadratic equation. But because A is born deficient, it didn't fit in there, and so Mahler's work has nothing to say about it. In fact, Mahler's work shows that the uh, some quotient space is compact, or at least finite volume, and the whole defining part of this is it's very big, it's infinite volume, and very flabby, and then it's very hard to work. Arithmetic. So, I'm not, I'm saying Mahler had good, better taste. <laughs> anyway, he was working on this a long time ago. He's one of the great founders of the geometry of numbers, amongst many things. There are uh, other arithmetic kind of sequences, not like this. this. You might view this as this is a funny construction of new numbers from old numbers. Each time it's a non commutative it's not very big non commutative group making new numbers from old numbers. There are recurrent sequences, which are simpler definitions of sequences where you ask about patterns in the sequence. And he played a very big role in those, uh, Mahler's theory. He, he worked in geometry of numbers, transcendence, his way to Have any other questions? Yeah, well, in that case, we can move to refreshments. But before we do that, please join me in thanking the